Hello, my name is Sonia Chaudhry, and today I will be sharing with you the story of Dr. Nettie Maria Stevens. This is Dr. Stevens, Westford Academy alumni, geneticist, researcher, and teacher. Spanning the years from the Civil War to World War I, Nettie lived during women's breakthrough in science and business. During the same time, Nettie watched the growth of her own field, genetics. Nettie's research was key to unraveling the mysteries of cytology and hereditary. We salute Dr. Stevens as part of our own town's heritage and her significant role in the world of science. Displayed here is Nettie's father, Ephraim Stevens, at about age 52 in 1885. As a skilled carpenter, Ephraim served on the Westford Town Hall building committees, where he hung the hall chandelier and furnished screws, spikes, and labor for $5.05 or $168 in today's currency. Nettie's mother, Julia Adams, with Chelmsford roots, is shown here as well. Shown here is a sketch of the ancient homestead that housed six generations of Stevens. The house stood at the Chelmsford end of Francis Hill. The house was sold in 1849 and is no longer standing. Fun fact, Nettie's grandfather, Asa Stevens, was second cousin to President Franklin Pierce. The president's father was born in Chelmsford and was later governor of New Hampshire. Nettie's birth and early childhood were spent in Cavendish, Vermont. It was here that her parents were married in 1856. Here is a childhood photograph of Nettie. She sits on the right of her father and her younger sister Emma is on the left. Nettie, born in 1861, is approximately three years old here. Emma, two years younger, was to share with Nettie a passion for scholarship and science. Charles Merrill, elder brother of Nettie, died shortly after his first birthday in 1858. Unfortunately, constant illness and consequent mortality ravaged many New England families during this time. Nettie was to lose her three brothers, her mother, and later her stepmother, Ellen. The death of Julia and another brother marked the end of the family settlement in Vermont. Ephraim remarried in 1865 to Ellen Thompson, and the family moved to Westford, Massachusetts. Ephraim moved his family to Forge Village, Westford, where he lived in an acreage that had been in his family. The Stevens would eventually move into 24 Main Street, pictured here. The last and only child born between Ephraim and Ellen Stevens was Edward Prescott Stevens, who died of scarlet fever in 1868. He is now buried in Fairview Cemetery. No more children were to be born after this, and Nettie and Emma would fill the roles of son and daughter and compete in the male world of science. Nettie's schooling began here, at the Forge Village Grammar School. From here, she would later progress to Westford Academy. Nettie pursued a classical course at Westford Academy and received a strong math science base. Nettie entered the academy just as C. Whitman concluded his term as principal from 1868 to 1872. Although their paths did not converge at that time, Whitman was later to recommend her for a Carnegie Institute research grant, which she won. Leonard Wheeler, whose reminiscences reflect the period, laments the reputation of Nettie and Emma Stevens. Not long after entering the academy, I had the luck at the periodical written examination to rank 99.6. The faculty gave me a hundred on the postage sheet of rankings. That rank was then undreamed of. Later, Emma and Nettie Stevens repeatedly got such rank by strenuous study. Nettie graduated from Westford Academy in 1880 with high honors. Her status was to change from that of student to teacher. Eventually, researcher would also be added. Emma followed her sister in the graduation class of 1882. She would teach grammar school in Westford. Both girls at Westford Academy enjoyed the tutelage of William E. Frost, the principal. Later, Nettie became a colleague at the Academy when she accepted her teaching post in 1885. Five years elapsed between Nettie's graduation and her reinstatement as teacher. After teaching for three terms at the high school in Lebanon, New Hampshire, she applied to and was accepted at Westfield State Normal School. Nettie enjoyed the highest entrance examination scores in a class of 30 individuals. Nettie's perfect attendance records and examination scores testify to her serious application. The preserved record of Westfield Normal School show her in entrance class lowest score to be a 95 in arithmetic. Nettie boarded in this dormitory during her stay at Westfield Normal. 
She completed the four-year course in only two years, a feat, according to the principal, only a genius could demonstrate. The 44th Annual Catalog of the State Normal School lists Nettie's name among the winter term graduates of 1883. Nettie returned to Westford, accepting a teaching application at school number six, the Minot's Corner School. Her salary was $28 per month. When a vacancy was offered in Westford Academy in 1885, she eagerly accepted. In this Westford Academy student body portrait, Nettie stands fifth in from the left in the middle row. William Frost is beyond her in a bowler hat. Nettie's Westford-based years were drawing to a close. She served as a library trustee in Westford for a short period of time in the early 90s. She would later vacate her academy teaching post in 1892. The Stevens family prepared to move once more. Ellen Thompson Stevens died in 1888 at the age of 46. She was memorialized in the First Parish Church and was buried in Fairview Cemetery, Westford. The Westford chapter of Nettie's life had ended. She would accept a position as assistant to principal at Belricka's Howe School. She would also serve as the second librarian of the Free Public Library in Chelmsford. But Nettie's local role was over. She was ready, at age 35, to begin the mature phase of her scientific career. When Nettie Stevens entered Stanford University in 1896, she was born on the wave of scientific and technological curiosity that was changing American life. Research was no longer solely applied to industry. The telephone and phonograph were in use. The Kodak box camera had been invented. Fingerprints had shown to be individual and permanent. X-rays had been discovered. The 20th century world was emerging under the lens of the microscope and in the vision of the inventor. In many ways, the West was still wild. Arizona and New Mexico had yet to join the Union. The Spanish-American War was still to be fought. But the West and Stanford University beckoned as points of new beginnings. The Stanfords had dowed the university for $5 million in memory of their late son Leland. This tuition-free center of higher learning drew male and female students from 44 different states. Women were agitating for entry into science, professions, and politics via suffrage. Ellen Swallow Richards asserted her faith in female participation in the future. Will women not boldly accept the 20th century challenge and fight her way to victory? Nettie had gone to school with Ellen and later received the American Women's Table Prize with Ellen's name on it. Nettie entered Stanford during the administration of David Starr Jordan, a leading scientist of the period. In addition to cost-free tuition and housing, Nettie enjoyed electrical lights and hot and cold water facilities. The Stanford Nettie knew was to provide progressive quality education until the great earthquake of 1906, which temporarily stunted its growth. After two terms at Stanford, Nettie applied for advanced standing status. This essentially deleted one year of study. Because she was so well qualified, this application was approved. Nettie studied physiology and histology under Oliver P. Jenkins. During the 1897 to 1898 school year, Nettie studied under Frank McFarland. McFarland had earned his PhD at the University of Würzburg, where Nettie would later study as well. Under McFarland, Nettie increasingly began to concentrate on histology, the study of minute structures of animal and vegetable tissue. Nettie's summers were spent at the Hopkins Marine Station at Monterey Bay, California. This station was the second oldest marine laboratory in the country after Woods Hole in Massachusetts. This photograph of digging at Woods Hole indicates that a hat is worn even while collecting specimens. Although Nettie is not in this scene, she spent time at Woods Hole, and it was probably here that she became acquainted with C.O. Whitman, director from 1893 to 1908. Nettie's brevity and clarity of work were often remarked upon. These two slides, which show her earning a bachelor's and master's in two years' time, would support the reports of her speed. The two new species bear the names McFarlandy and Bovary, respectively. Nettie's involvement in a new expanding field is apparent. She was to study with McFarland and Bovary, the namesakes of the species indicated. Nettie appears here as a Stanford graduate at almost 40 years old. 
Nettie left Stanford to pursue her PhD at Bryn Mawr in the fall of 1900. Her career at Bryn Mawr was beginning under the direction of Edmund B. Wilson and Thomas Hunt Morgan. Wilson and Stevens, working independently, would be the first scientists to demonstrate that sex was determined by a particular chromosome. In just such a library, Nettie deduced from work with beetles that the male produced two kinds of sperm, one carrying the large X chromosome and the one carrying the smaller Y chromosome. Knowing that all unfertilized eggs were all alike in possessing two X chromosomes, Nettie correctly inferred that an embryo resulting from an X-carrying sperm would be female, and that fertilized by a Y sperm, male. Nettie would perfect the sex chromosome correlation in her future studies with Rose Aphids. Thomas H. Morgan figured heavily in Nettie's Bryn Mawr education and in her research career. In 1933, Morgan received the Nobel Prize for Physiology. Together, Morgan and Stevens published material on the regenerative traits of the hydrate tubularia. Morgan observed of his student, Nettie Stevens has not only the training, but she has also the natural talent that is, I believe, much rarer to find. In 1903, Nettie earned her PhD from Bryn Mawr. She's shown here in the front row, fifth from the right. From here, she would apply to the Carnegie Institution for a research grant to study gender determination. The following year, Nettie won the Ellen Richards Research Prize of $1,000, about $33,667 today, for her paper, A Study of the Germ Cells of Aphis Rosé and Aphis Oenotheriae. A copy of the prize-winning paper is now in the J.V. Fletcher Library. Nettie was in the prime, but unfortunately near the end of her career. She has studied from 1901 to 1902 with Professor Theodore Boveri at the Zoological Institute at Würzburg, Germany. She continued to research in the companion Naples Zoological Station in Italy. This photo of Nettie with Dr. Boveri, his family, and others were taken in the peak of her research. Over the next two years, she would publish steadily. Dr. Stevens Scientific Home in Naples, Italy. And this is Dr. Stevens working at the Zoological Station in Naples, Italy as well. Dr. Stevens died of breast cancer at 50 years old, a great loss to her family and the scientific world. She was buried in Fairview Cemetery here in Westford, where she spent a large chunk of her life. Here is a telegraph sent to Nettie's sister Emma informing her of her death. Nettie's personal effects went to Emma and her scientific instruments to Bryn Mawr. Dr. Stevens' scientific career lasted barely 12 years, yet within this time she made a contribution to the field of genetics and furthered the role of women in scientific professions. Her dedication to scientific standards stands in solidarity to her theories. Last but not least, a word of thanks to Carrie Stevens, Nettie's cousin. She looked upon Nettie as an idol, and her collected photos and information made this presentation possible.